you, right? Heather says yes. <laughs> but there was somebody that uh, registered from the UK. Thank you. Also, I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Time is one of the most precious gifts we have in this life. And I'm always honored when people give their time, um, particularly for this project that I'm so passionate about. I actually wanna see, I think if I, I think I can go back and forth and see some folks. So just a, a couple of housekeeping things while we're waiting, just to let you know, everybody's gonna be muted on entry into the room. That just helps uh, with background noise. If you've got cats, kids at home, dogs, uh, that just helps uh, kind of cut down on that background noise. Um, but you're gonna be able to communicate with us via chat. There's a chat box in Zoom if you're not familiar. Um, it's down at the bottom of the little little chat icon. You can type in there, hi, uh, any questions you have, put that in there. Program manager uh, Katie will be managing that section. She'll be feeding me some things. Hi, Melissa, I know you. Uh, I can also see that. And um, we have a lot of information in a really short amount of time. So um, if you could hold your questions to the end or put them in the chat box, we'll get to them. Um, but yeah, this is so exciting. Uh, see some familiar faces. There's Melissa, Christina, Sandy. This just warms my heart so much, so much. I'm excited. All right, so we're at 11.04. So while we're waiting for more people to come in, I would love to hear how you heard about this workshop. Was it Facebook, Instagram? Did a friend share it? I'm just curious. Plus, I think it's good information for the This Is My Brave team. So when we roll out the next workshop, folks will be able, we'll know where to better uh, put the energy. So in the chat box, let me know how you heard about the This Is My Brave storyteller. Awesome sauce. Somebody heard about it from the St. Louis Show producers. Awesome. IG, love that. Ben went to Facebook ad to sign it up. Oh gosh, I just love Facebook ads. <laughs> Katie, yes, Katie has been sharing so much. Thank you. Twitter, yes. We've got some social media queens here and kings, love that. Twitter search, awesome sauce. All right, so we're at 11.05. Does this look about just about everybody? Kind of, okay. All right, so I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna share my screen so you might not see me, but you're gonna see the presentation. And again, any questions, things going, uh, any feedback you have, just put it in the comment section and Katie will be moderating there. Awesome, here we go, sharing. I'm gonna do desktop, share. Also, it's allergy season, folks, so. <laughs> If you hear me sneezing, I apologize in advance. It's like my body has to adjust to allergy season. And then, and today, the pollen monster just got me, y'all. It just got me. So <laughs> bear with me. Also, just want to let you know, we are recording this um, Zoom call. That way, we'll be able to distribute it uh, later for folks. And um, what you'll hear more about later we're gonna give you the copy of the slides so you'll be able to study and do some homework. All right, so we are in it. You are now in the Brave Storyteller Workshop. All right, let's make sure. Yep, there we are, wants to play nice. So today, we are going to be talking about how to tell your story from a place of empowerment and hope. I'm your facilitator today, Lauren Hope. So I'm gonna go over the housekeeping rules just one more time. If you're in the Zoom meeting, all people inside the Zoom meeting will be muted just to help with the background noise. Don't you love those people? We're all doing housekeeping. <laughs> oh, that was cute. And again, uh, feel free to use that chat feature box. Um, Katie will be moderating that and feeding me some information. Please hold your questions to the end of the presentation because we've got a lot that I want to share with you and I want to be mindful of your time. And, um, and then again, I already asked that, mentioned where you heard about us, and I'll, I'll um, probably ask you that again. All right, so just a little bit about me. I am a former television journalist. I've worked about three stations. I have over five years experience as a television reporter. Um, I have recently become a motivational speaker. I'm a blogger, mental health advocate, certified peer recovery specialist. I'm a member for the American Foundation for um, Suicide Prevention here in Virginia. I also do peer trainings with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, but overall, I am a storyteller, as many of you. Um, so how I heard, oops, sugar snaps and beans. 
I got too happy previous. <laughs> So how did I hear about This Is My Brave? When I started uh, blogging about my mental health journey, a friend told me about This Is My Brave, and it really emboldened me to keep sharing. I had the amazing opportunity to be in the Arlington show in 2018, where I shared a story about living with anxiety attacks. It was called uh, Men in Steel Spiked Boots. Um, if you've never experienced a This Is My Brave show, I just wanted to show you the highlight video. It's really short um, about our show. You can see me right there looking really pensive and deep in that pink shirt. <laughs> All right, I'm going to play this because uh, it just gives like um, some, t some color and really gives you an idea of what it's like to be in a This Is My Brave show. People should know about This Is My Brave because it is an incredible organization doing wonderful things. I love hearing truthful stories about people's um, struggles and achievements. I will win because I'm standing here with no shame, breaking the silence again. It's weird to think that being exposed is worse than the suffering. <laughs> I wanted to help end the stigma of what addiction looks like. I wanted to be open and show people that it's okay to talk about addiction within families without being judged. There were some people that, you know, had moments uh, that were, you know, very similar to things that I feel. Today, I feel like a whole human being. Today, I feel like Heather. Mental illness and addiction do not define me. My definition is Heather, and don't you forget it. I don't know why it should be any different than any other, you know, medical treatment. Everybody has a different story to tell, right? And everybody has um, that place where they want to get to. This woman standing in front of you today that was once jobless, unhappy, and on welfare, and attempted to take her life because of life traumas and emotional pain, is now the founder of Reconnecting Our Communities. Teaching people that they're not alone, that everyone struggles, and that we all need each other to provide that support and help people get through each day, each tough day. Um, and Jen Marshall and her crew do an incredible job of reaching people, letting people know that they're not alone. And I think that at the end of the day, that's really what everybody needs to know they're not alone. I love that so much. Oh, I love, I love, I love, I love that. If you've never had the opportunity to go to a show, I highly, highly recommend it. As you can hear from the people in the audience, it's something powerful for the storyteller and the audience member, which we'll talk more about. I'm actually still friends with a lot of folks that I was in that show with uh, personally. And uh, so it was really, really great to be a part of that. So, all right. Oh, she wants to play again. <laughs> you got to love technology. All right. So I wanted to start off with this quote by a co-founder of This Is My Brave, Jennifer Marshall, which really captures what This Is My Brave is about and captures uh, why we tell our stories on this platform. So Jen says, it's my opinion that we won't be able to end the stigma surrounding mental illness and addiction until we put our names and faces on our stories. I love that because that's what storytelling is. It's bringing people into our lived experience. There is no one face or one person um, that looks like mental illness and substance use disorder. All right, so this is the part where you get to participate. I'd love for you to put in the comments section um, your name, where you're, where you're coming from, and something interesting about yourself. Uh, is it uh, that you can do cartwheels really well, or you're a great artist or painter, please let us know. want to learn a little bit about you. As I was thinking about this, the interesting thing about me, did you know that not everybody can roll their tongue like this? Well, like, you know how you like roll? Right, I see Jen doing it. <laughs> For some, some people, that's difficult. So I thought, I was thinking about my fun fact. My fun fact is I'm a tongue roller <laughs> among other things. <laughs> Uh, I'd also love um, for you guys to get to know each other in there. So something fun about yourself. All right. So we have Melissa Nolan from Houston. And Melissa is one of our um, producers also. And we have, oh, and Melissa has curly hair. Very curly oh, hair. That is a beautiful trait. <laughs> That's really curly hair. Yes. We have Sandy. I don't know where Sandy's from yet. Wait, you know Sandy though, right? Sandy is from North Carolina. Perfect. 
Um, we have Jen, of course, Jen Marshall, zooming in from the DC metro area. And wow. her fun fact is that she played water polo in college. Oh, wow. That is really cool. It is a fun fact. Um, Isaac. We have Isaac from Brighton, Illinois. He has three daughters that all look like him but have their mother's attitude. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac's my mental health professional for the St. Louis show. Um, we have Erin, our program manager with This Is My Brave from Richmond, Virginia, and she was in the marching band in college. Yes, marching bands. <laughs> we have Adrian from Philly. Um, she said, people assume I come from a family of gymnasts because they pronounce our name wrong. Oh, wait, I lost it. Car wheel, no T. Oh, ha, that's funny. <laughs> We have Patrick Johnson from Virginia Beach. Fun fact is that he used to live in Japan for a year after college. Awesome. That's cool. And Patrick is in our Hampton Roads show. Thank you so much for, uh, for tuning in with us today. Awesome sauce. Welcome, Very Patrick. cool stuff there. We have Heather. Um, she's, one of, she's my co-producer for the St. Louis show. Um, she's from St. Louis. She's with her sister right now, Holly, in Lawrence, Kansas. And... She said, I can ride horses and Holly loves to swim. So they're both joining in on right now. Awesome. Um, we have Anita from Richmond, Virginia. Her fun fact is she used to play the trumpet in high school. Oh, love all these. It, Lots of musicians, musicians here. here. Uh, Christina from Cleveland, Ohio used to have a podcast. Yes, she did. Oh, Anita and Erin, you're both in Richmond. You guys should be friends. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, friends. And we're going to have another opportunity for you guys to chime in. Oh, just so one more. We have Eileen from Baltimore, now in Florida, figuring out how Zoom works. Oh. <laughs> we're all, we're all in this together. We're all in a learning curve right now, right? Because <laughs> everything is, uh, is uh, virtual and digital now. So why do stories matter, right? Why is it important that we share our stories? Well, there's actually been a lot of research on how we connect to each other with stories. What we've heard through psychologists and researchers is that stories bind us together. Think about the original storytellers. Way, way, way back in the day, it was the Egyptians, right? They did hieroglyphics. They recorded their history right there. Or think about the cavemen who were around the, the campfire. That's how they told their history. We're the only animals on the planet that record our lives through stories. Unless you believe Disney and there are ants in the ground having a whole nother life talking to each other. I might secretly believe that. But uh, I wanted to share something with you, this amazing clip. It's actually an advertisement. Um, but really, it shows the power of stories, right? I always remember journalism school, my teacher would say, people will always remember how you make them feel with your story. So aim for the heart. And I love this commercial because it does just that. And you'll be very surprised to see what it's advertising. Evening. Evening. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, Tubbs, I read your book. You read my book? Mm-hmm. Give that man the bells. <laughs> I legit get goosebumps every time I see that commercial. That was an advertisement about scotch, right? But really, it was telling us a story about a father's love that was so strong that he learned, started learning how to read later in life so he could read his son's story. And I wanted to share that with you because it just shows the power of storytelling. Um, because I'm kind of a storytelling nerd, I, my favorite part of Super Bowl Sunday are the commercials. I like to see what people are telling, the stories they're telling through these commercials. And, um, I use that because a lot of marketers are starting to see the power of storytelling. All right. Another powerful thing about storytelling is that we know, researchers again, have seen that storytelling has the power to slay stigma. When we think about mental illness and substance use disorder, we know that these are um, things that a lot of people feel stigma about. Stigma is you are seen um, negatively because of your mental illness or your addiction, or people treat you a certain type of way based on that. So there is one of the many researchers looking at how storytelling plays a role in mental illness is Dr. Patrick Corgan. He's actually done a lot of research about storytelling as it relates to stigma. He made a program called Honest Open Crowd that teaches people how to tell their stories because what he found is when people can tell their story from a place of power and, um, and hope, it does something for them as well as the audience. I love this quote. He says, research shows that those who have disclosed aspects of their mental illness report a sense of personal empowerment and an increase in confidence to seek and achieve their individual goals. This is something I've experienced also. The more I've shared my story, the stronger I felt. And then when I shared it and I could see other people nodding and identifying with it, it brought me a lot of peace and acceptance about my story. We'll hear more about Dr. Corgan as it relates to the Honest, Open, Proud program and um, how he teaches people to tell their story. So when we talk about recovery, right? Because we want to tell our stories from a place of recovery. When you hear that word, what do you think? And um, Katie's going to give me some responses. What do you think of when you hear the word recovery? Is it empowered? Is it independence? Is it whatever that looks like to you? In the comment section, put a couple of adjectives or words, things you think about when you hear the word recovery. And we'll take about two or three responses. We have hope, confidence, healing, growth, and strength. Let's see. The idea that tomorrow can be better than today and today is better than yesterday. I love that. I love that. And so that's what, that's what we want to share our stories from, a place of recovery. So SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration defines recovery as a process of change through which individuals improve their health, wellness and live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. So when we're talking about our stories from a place of rec uh, recovery, we want to show people how we've gone through a journey to living a self-directed uh, life. All right, so there is a way to tell your story, right? Sometimes there's a difference between a war story and a recovery story. Who knows the character on Saturday Night Live? Her name is Debbie Downer, right? Debbie Downer. One of my favorite episodes about Debbie, Debbie Downer is that she's at Walt Disney World, the happiest place on earth. Everyone's having a good time. And Debbie brings up the topic of feline AIDS. That's the thing she's most passionate about is feline AIDS. And I'm like, oi vey, we were all feeling good until Debbie Downer started talking, right? That's kind of what I think of when I think about a war story, right? It's kind of telling everybody all the hard, awful, tough things that happen to us, right? With no context. Now, that's not to say that war stories don't have a place, right, with our therapists in a support group, because I think it's important that we do share the challenging parts of our story. A recovery story, though, is different, right? We're going to give people a glimpse of our journey, right, how we got from point A 
to be, but we're going to highlight the positive. I really like how the 12-step model teaches people to tell their stories, NA and AA, right? They say to tell people your experience, your strength, and your hope. So you're going to tell me what you went through, right? Tell me the who, what, when, why, how, how it affected you, right? Then give me the strength. What did you learn through that journey? Because those lessons that you've learned, you're now giving away. And then what's the hope? What is in your story that can empower me and show me that recovery is possible? And that's where I think the best stories lie when we tell them from a place of recovery. So what makes a strong recovery talk? Let's talk about it. My computer is being funny. Hold on, play for me. There it is. Our recovery story should raise hope. We should show people through our recovery that recovery is possible. So give examples in your mental health story or um, your story of overcoming of how you got through this. That's incredibly powerful. Also, your recovery story should educate people. A lot of people who are coming to this platform maybe have never experienced mental illness or addiction or don't know anyone who has. So tell them information about how it felt, the challenges, and how you got through it. Then make it real for them. Share your personal experience. And sometimes this is challenging. Sometimes people want to share their story, but from a kind of removed place. Show me how that felt, how it affected your family, things of that nature. That makes it real for people. So when we share our story, though, we have to be mindful that it comes from a place of um, empowerment and we do it in a way that's safe. Particularly when we're sharing stories about mental illness and substance use disorder, it can stir up some things in us, whether we, uh, whether we realize it or not. So it's important that we're aware of triggers, right? Does everybody know what a trigger is? A trigger is something in us, right, that elicits a negative response. Like, let's say you had a boyfriend who was really, really terrible, and his cologne, right, sets you off. Every time you smell that cologne, you're like, oh, you think again about that guy, right? That's, I thought that was a visceral way to think of triggers, right? So if there's a part of your story that you're still raw about, that's okay. Take some time processing it. Maybe it's not the time to share it. And I'll be honest with you, there's parts of my story that I don't share because it's still raw for me. Um, and we also do that to protect the audience members, right? Because some, if we're triggered, right, and we're like, oh, uh, 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 the people lose that empowerment part of the story, and then they're worried about us. They're concerned. Um, so we always want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves when we share our stories. So I work with a lot of people in motivational speaking um, at my business, and I do workshops and things of that nature. And before people are going to share their story, I always ask them to answer these questions. Have you worked on your recovery? What does that look like? Have you been to therapy? Are you in groups? Have you come to a consistent place of wellness? Have you learned how to manage those triggers? Then I ask, what have you learned about yourself and your recovery? Because I find when people are able to answer those questions, those, that's the hope shot that you want to give in your empowerment story. Then I ask, how do you believe your story will help others? That's another instance where I feel like if you're able to answer that question, you're in a place to start carving your recovery story because you've gotten to a place where you could see the lessons, the hope, and the strength. So again, one more thing about safe messaging. Um, if your story mentions suicide or suicide loss, we never describe the means that someone died by suicide. There's something called the contagion effect. What we've heard is that when we talk about suicide in a way that's glamorizing or maybe we tell the means, someone who's at a risk for suicide that could bolster that risk. So we wanna be safe about that. Another thing that I've learned in my work with AFSP when we talk about suicide, we never say committed suicide. There's a lot of negative connotations around saying the word committed. So we say died by suicide or suicide loss. And I know that that's some languaging we're still teaching people. Also, we want to be careful that we don't name the exact name of our medications, right? Because most of us, I, I gather, are not doctors or physicians. So we don't want to seem like we're selling a certain thing. But we can say I take an antidepressant or medications worked for me or this type of therapy work, worked for me. And also be really sure to not, particularly if we didn't have a great experience, mention the name of the psychiatric facility or hospital that we went to. You could just say, I was an inpatient or um, I went to a hospital to help with that. 
because again, we, we want to share our stories from a place of empowerment. Now, getting back to Dr. Corgan, his program called um, From Honest, Open, Proud, right? He has a workshop called Share or Not to Share. And it's a coaching, it's a, a workshop that focuses on people who have experienced um, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So here are some tips he gives on how to share your story, right? Give us concrete examples, right? Help us hear, feel, and taste your story, right? So be really specific about that. Remember back in elementary school, people, places, things, who, what, when, where, how? That's what we mean about being concrete. Give your stories color, right? Don't say, you could say, yeah, depression is really hard, right? It is really hard. Or we could say, Depression affected me this way. I would often lie in the bed for days on end, smelling like sweat because I didn't shower, right? We're saying the same thing, but that second one, right, is helping me really visualize what that experience is like. Also, another tip that Dr. Corgan gives is don't be afraid to use professional terms. So there is a certain type of therapy that I've, I've uh, recently learned about called EDMR. And most people aren't sure what EDMR is, right? So rather than saying trauma therapy, tell me what EDMR is in layman's terms, right? So I understand because again, we are experts on this, right? This lived experience. And our story is teaching the audience something. So you can let them know like the professional parts of your story. Be sure to share how your story, right, your suicide attempt, mental illness, and or substance use disorder affected the people around you, right? That really grounds it too, because we know this experience is not just ours. Our loved ones also um, deal with this too. And then again, how did you overcome the challenges? That's really where our power and hope comes from, where we tell people how we've overcome and the lessons that we've learned. <laughs> Well, how about that, y'all? I'm really proud of myself. It's 1129 and we're already at the end. Homework time, yes. <laughs> so that was a lot to digest there. So we're gonna send you the slides after this. And I want you to really marinate on the things I've said. And my challenge for you, now that you've got the creative juices flowing, tell me what your story is, right? In three words. Now, when I was a television reporter and I was struggling for a focus, right, because we had to tell a lot of stories in one day, I always boiled my story down to a simple sentence, subject, verb, object. People are like, oh no, she's taking me back to school. I can't handle this. Subject, verb, object. So I would force myself to keep my story in those three, um, in a really simple sentence. And everything I wrote had to go to that focus. Example. Uh, reporter overcomes mental illness, right? Blogger learns hope through storytelling. That's a really simple, tight focus. And that's what I'm going to connect my story to. Or three adjectives. Because I find sometimes people are like, I can't do this subject, verb, object. I can't do it. I get it. What are three adjectives that describe your story? Is it hope, strength, overcoming? Is it, no, those are not adjectives as I'm taking you to school. <laughs> it is beauty uh that's interesting as i'm sitting here right i'm taking y'all to school and i'm like adjectives adjectives <laughs> but basically give me three words that describe your story right and then ask yourself what do you want people to walk away with do you want them to feel inspired do you want them to leave being ready to have a real conversation with somebody? Do you want them to leave feeling acceptance and peace? And I always like to tell people to do that because that those three words will connect to that takeaway. That's your like beginning and end point to your story. If you've got those two things, all we gotta do is work on everything in between. So that's your homework. I'm gonna send you the PowerPoint slides. I would love, love, love um, for you to email me your homework. You don't have to. I get that life is busy right now, but I would love to see where your, you know, where your head is at. My email is lhope at, at thisismybrave.org. Lhope at thisismybrave.org. I see Katie typing. She's going to put it in there. I'd love to see that because, because uh, next week we'll do part two of the workshop. And I'd love to get an idea of some of the focuses um, that you guys are working on. And we'll really get into the nitty gritty of looking at those next week. So I went right to 1130, Katie. I don't know if we have time for questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> 
We can we can take a couple if you want. Let's do it. We want to be mindful of people's time. So if anyone has any questions, type them in the chat box now. I'll address what we can. And then you can always email us afterwards, any one of us, um, if you have any questions. I'm going to end that there. Isaac said no questions, but thanks for a great <laughs> workshop. Yay, thank you so much. I can't think, my, my dog just wanted to say hi. <laughs> I can't thank you guys enough for spending your time with us. So next week, we're gonna come right back here, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're gonna do part two. As you can see on my little slide, there is storytelling workshop, story art and development. So we're gonna start with those three words that you gave me. We're gonna talk about how to flesh that into um, a talk. Um. I think we're good. Everyone's just saying thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. This was amazeballs. Thank you. Gosh, uh, my heart is very full. I cannot wait to see you all next week and hear where your stories are. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Bye. Oh my gosh, so great seeing all these faces. Happy Friday. Oh, I love this feedback here. I'm looking at the chats now. Oh, y'all go make me cry. <laughs> awesome sauce. Awesome, awesome.